Hey, welcome to our latest live interviews. Uh, tonight we've got Ian Keith from Ireland and it's a great privilege to chat to, I uh, chat to Ian. <laughs> I, um, I met Ian at the start of the Northern Traverse a couple of years ago and uh, we had a quick chat but then Ian was away and I didn't see him again. <laughs> but uh, thanks so much Ian for, uh, for giving some time this evening and I'm hoping no that there'll be, some, uh, there'll be some live questions as we go along. I've got a few questions that I want to ask. I've got a little video clip of you, which we'll show a bit later as well. So those who are watching, feel free to ask some questions and we'll take it from there. But maybe just to start with Ian, you can just tell us just a little bit about what you're doing today and what it's like for in this lockdown time for, for you at the moment. Well, uh, we're in Ireland, so uh, well, I'm in Ireland, so I have a slightly different set of rules to the UK rules. We're only allowed exercise within two kilometers of our front door. So uh, today I start off, uh, I'm working from home, but I've kept my uh, kind of pattern. So I start off by doing my morning commute, and I normally commute into work, which is uh, about 40 minutes into town. So instead I go out to the shed, I sit on my turbo trainer for about an hour, and I uh, do a simulation of commuting. Uh and then back in and actually sit in front of the computer. Uh, so for lunchtime today, I went down and the weather actually turned good at lunchtime. And I did uh, about uh, about uh, an hour or so of a tempo run just on the roads. So once a week, I do a, a kind of high speed tempo run like that to try and keep the speed work up. So today I said I got to keep it relatively short and, and fit in the speed. Uh, whereas a lot of other days I actually I live within two kilometers. I have one nice big hill in, in South Dublin, which is Tree Rock, a very well known mountain. And it just so happens that it's no accident. I live within uh, striking range of that as far as our <laughs> lockdown is concerned so uh, quite often I'll do uh, loops around Tree Rock and get in a good little hill run there so I do still get to get in the hills despite our lockdown here and uh, yeah so working from home and two slots of exercise so far and uh, at the end of this I'll go and do my evening commute back home <laughs> by walking back into the shed and sitting on the turbo trainer for another hour. <laughs> Uh, what about work-wise, Ian? What, what, what do you do? I work for the IT department of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. So uh, I'm actually a programmer. So it's, it's, I'm actually busier these days working from home because uh, mm. the IT department is keeping up the entire college. And it's uh, obviously being a, a medical school, we're pretty critical to everything going on mm. at the moment. So uh, we're... I'm actually way busier than I have been before the the whole restrictions and lockdown came in. And it's great to actually have a job that uh, contributes in some way to, to helping things out. Yeah, yeah. I, I just put on the, um, when I put this out live, that um, Ian Keith is an Irish ultra runner who is cur currently holds the Irish record for 24-hour running, 248.4 kilometres, the 48-hour road running, 343 kilometers and the six day running uh, record 815 as well as many course records for Irish ultras you've also won the spine in 2016 and northern traverse in 2018 and lots of other races and um, so just tell us just a little bit of how you got into running and what attracted you to, to running in the first place please i got actually in all fairness, say I had the Irish 24 hour running record oh. until uh, January when uh, one of my uh, good friends went and broke it up in Finland in an indoor race. He, he got a, an extra four or 500 meters on me, which, <laughs> oh, <laughs> close, but well done to him. 400 so, meters, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's within a kilometer anyway. Well, I'd broken the previous record by 40 meters, which is yeah. <laughs> it's a tiny little sliver in 24 hour terms. So, yeah. fair enough. Uh, what was the question again? Well, it was sort of how you got into running. You know, we, we've, we've seen the it. end and yeah. some of the things you've done, but how did it start? Yeah, it's a very good question because I was, I didn't grow up in it with any kind of sporting background, never mind athletics background. Mm. I was a kind of sciencey nerdy kid. And, uh, the, in school and PE, a good, a good day for me would have been coming second last in a running race because they're oh, all wow. sprints and I'm still not a sprinter. Mm -hmm. Um, so what got, um, 
the only sport I really did as a teenager was pitch and putt, which, <laughs> <laughs> again, not exactly the background you'd be expecting. Mm. But I, I suppose uh, I had a few friends who uh, were into hill walking and things like that, and one of them became uh, captain of the hill walking uh, club in my college. And he and another one of my college uh, classmates basically dragged me out onto a mountain one day and uh, I just loved it and realized how great the mountains were and what an escape it was from normal life mm. and I just it was awesome so that got me into hill walking and I spent a lot of my 20s doing hill walking and, and sort of moving up into you know alpine mountaineering and things like that and another friend of mine uh sort of I accidentally ended up sort of volunteering for a mountain marathon, you know, the, the classic uh, two day navigation events. Mm. And again, uh, after initially wondering what the hell is this, uh, I really got into it and loved the competitive aspect, which is the one thing I didn't, uh, one thing I missed from hill walking was the lack of competition because I'm quite competitive as it turns out. <laughs> um, so yeah, they're the same gang I sort of knew from hill walking and uh, mountain marathons were uh, f quite a few of them uh, decided to enter the marathon in Dublin in 1998 and I, being the idiot I was, just went along with it and uh, decided I'd go as well. And in the last big training session we did for that, a 20 mile long run, I realized when I ran away from them all that I actually had a bit of talent. So I just had my, my target for the marathon and decided to go for a sub three and ran 257, mm. which was pretty good for a first marathon. Mm. And that's what I knew I could run. Mm. I always suspected I had endurance, but I didn't, you know, apart from going the hill walking, I didn't really try out anything at speed like that. So that kind of... That was good and bad. It was good because obviously it was a great achievement to run a sub three marathon. Mm. But uh, the bad bit is, what's the next target after yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sub two thirty is the next thing that springs to mind, and that's a hell of a long way down <laughs> from sub two up on two fifty seven. So, uh, but I knew I was good at longer stuff. So what eventually happened is, you know, at that time. Uh, there was really only one ultra run on in Ireland, which was a race which is now called the Morris Mullins Ultra, which was a fifty k trail race. And I entered it uh, within a year or two, and uh, it ended up being a four-way battle. And uh, I really enjoyed the battle, even though I came fourth in that four-way battle. Mm -hmm. But again, it just spurred me on to come back and give, give it another go. And, you know, I was on the podium the next year and eventually sort of ended up dominating the race with it for a few years. But that kind of got me into the, the ultra stuff. And the organizers there would have been... Again, the ultra running scene in Ireland at the time, you could have uh, fitted everyone in a telephone box. Mm. Uh, so the organizer there was uh, uh, asked you to try out for the Anglo or to try the Anglo Celtic plate, 100k Home Nations International. And uh, so uh, that was my first uh, bigger ultra, I suppose, 100k pushing it out again. And uh, again, I did okay at that. It was on up in uh, Harry White University in Edinburgh when I gave it a go. Uh, but I was a bit disappointed with myself because uh, for the first sort of half of it, the first 50k I ran, well, I can't remember the length of the laps, but I ran the laps in about 16 minutes. In the second half, I ran the laps in about 18 minutes. And I was disappointed with myself for the lack of even pacing. Mm -hmm. But then they, this is pre-internet days, they posted up everyone's time uh, and on, in the gym area and all their last splits at the end. And I went around and looked at all the competitors' time, including, you know, UK international, six and Irish international, etc. So, uh, and I realized I had the slowest or the, the least amount of uh, um, fall off in my lap times. So I realized I had a, a good talent for pacing, even at this level, it yeah. was pretty good. Mm -hmm. And again, this just encouraged me, uh, you know, to come back and work on pushing out my 100Ks. And over time, I was pushing it out, did my first 24 hour race in Tooting Beck a couple of years later. Uh, must have been about six years later because I think I was 35 or 36 at that time. And I'd done my first marathon when I was 30. Um, and because uh, there was uh, the two, there was only two people on the 40 in the race. So we were, <laughs> we both looked at each other in the star line and she said, you're yes. <laughs> the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, again, it ended up being a great competitive race where it ended up being a three-way battle like I came second. Uh, and I uh, ended up at 198k for um, 
24 hours, which was pretty, pretty good. But I, I'd walked the last five hours or so because I just raced too hard and learned so much and just, again, enthused to come back. So the pattern there is kind of obvious. The longer the race yeah. you're getting, the, the more competitive I was getting. Yeah. So yeah. the rest of my life is basically be pushing that boat out, yeah. and, you know, stronger, stronger, longer and longer. Yeah. Uh, I suppose the odd thing in my case is I'm pushing it out of two fronts, uh, both the, the classic road and uh, flat ones, like the the 24 hours, the 100Ks, the, uh, you know, up to six days, obviously. And also equally keeping the, the mountain stuff uh, on the go as well and, and very much you know, enjoying that side and using it to explore the world as much as anything else. And in parallel at the same time, I was also got into around the same time, not long after my first marathon in the year 2000, uh, started doing adventure racing as well. Same mm -hmm. crowd, same, same bad influence dragged me into that. <laughs> and, uh, so at the same time for, for a long number of years until about probably about five or six years ago, I used to do adventure racing in parallel. So I was also, as well as doing the ultra running, I was doing mountain biking and kayaking and, you know, getting a lot of all around stuff. And they were even longer races. The longest race in terms of time I've completed was a, an adventure race, which took about nine days to complete. So. <laughs> Well, Ian, we've got a few people uh, online now and watching us, and we've got some questions coming in, so let's deal with those, and then cool. we'll come back to one or two other races I'd like to chat about. Um, so, uh, Robbie Marsh says, what, uh, what was it your biggest learning from the Backyard event this year? And maybe you can just explain what the Backyard event was. So, the Backyard, which Robbie is obsessed with, <laughs> is uh, <laughs> Laz's, uh, another one of Laz's creations, which mm. is... Uh, you, there are loops uh, which are about 4.2 miles well what they are is exactly 1 24th of 100 mile in length because the idea is you do one loop per hour every hour so if you do 24 loops you do 100 miles in a day um the, now the the trick with them of course is that you start at a fixed time and every loop starts at the same fixed time so if the first loop is at midday the second loop is at one o'clock and the third is at two o'clock and so on and uh, you have to start at exactly the start time so if you finish a loop in 40 minutes you then have to hang around for 20 yeah. then start the next one mm -hmm. and it just keeps going and going <laughs> until only one person yeah. completes uh, the final loop yeah. uh, and the, the assist is the person who comes second because he assists the finish <laughs> <laughs> well in fact there is no second it's only a first loser because yeah. uh, there's only ever one winner yeah. in the backyard which is, which is a great thing about it so it's a for me, I've always said it's uh, there. There's two of them on in Ireland. If it happens, one of the early countries to franchise the rather than copy was was Ireland, um, and then uh, so there's a, a good uh, a good strong number of people doing it here these days. So um, the interesting thing about it, and one of the reasons I think it's possibly the most difficult format is when you're on that start line you have no idea what it takes to win mm -hmm. no idea because mm -hmm. it could be it could be it's all down to who the, the, the last two people are yeah. so you could you could be there for 40 hours you could be there for 80 hours god only knows mm -hmm. and all it's all kinds of speculation what the, the ultimate limit is um my biggest learning uh, i was actually very comfortable with the physical side of it and where I cracked, and we had a really bad one uh, in the race I tried earlier because we got hit by storm. Uh, well, I can't remember the name. We had Brendan for the spine, but I think we're up to D for uh, <laughs> for the backyard. We had another name, Storm, for the backyard. So, and was that the uh, one in I Ireland? For, that was the one in Ireland. Yeah. yeah. So we had we had uh, horrendous rain, and uh, I actually had trench foot for most of the race, even though I was wearing waterproof shoes. There was just no escape from it. Yeah. Uh, and there was high winds. One of the, the race marquees got destroyed within the first hour. So uh, <laughs> one of those days. But I managed to get in 40 hours, but I was only the assist. So uh, 40 hours is my limit. Uh, I came set, first loser, correct myself. Uh, but uh, that was pretty good on an international scale, but still. It's, it's only second. Um, my biggest learning was that I have to 
have to figure out how to get my sleep deprivation dialed in for the backyard because it's a, that's for me is the hardest thing to do. The, the pacing, as I was saying earlier, for me is relatively straightforward because I can bang out very even paces and I'm used to running loops from running the 24 hour races and even six day races. It's managing that, that sleep uh, tiredness is the, the hard bit for me. So the, my, my work take my takeaway from it is to work on how to work that through and figure it out which is much easier said than done <laughs> yeah excellent and will you be back for another go do you think well i have actually uh, got an entry for the the world championship which is laz's original backyard ultra oh. in tennessee in laz's backyard oh. but whether it takes place or not god only knows because okay. uh, but it's not till uh, i think it's october i have to try and remember <laughs> but something like that so there's a chance it'll yeah. happen but yeah. we don't know yet. yeah okay a question from james Bly. he says uh, hello uh, so what kind of pace do you do regarding win or to be competitive he changed that he said competitively but um, competitive so what kind of pace do, do you need to do to win or be competitive uh well it depends obviously on who your uh, mm. competitors are yeah, <laughs> yeah. well uh, it's easier said than done on uh, i Probably easier to, to, to find pacing in the flat ones, like the 24 hours, mm. uh, where I know exactly what the pace I want to set out. And I'll usually, end up, I'll usually target doing 10 kilometers an hour, mm. about six miles an hour on a 24-hour race, and just try and keep that steady the whole way through. And on a good day, uh, I'll, I'll adjust based on feel then. So on a good day, that goes out a bit. So that's how I've made it up to 248K. So that, that would have been pacing a bit better mm. most of the day but it's still quite rare to get over 240 so normally it's a bit of a tail off at some stage uh, but i kind of regard that 10 kilometer an hour for 24 hours as being my sort of golden pace uh and i know exactly what it feels like so for a, a mountain ultra sorry it's just, all on just can i just ask you on that one then so does it not matter who else is running on a 24 hour race no, do you, it, do you almost case, ignore them I ignore them, absolutely. Yeah. And I'll spend the first 12 hours minimum absolutely ignoring everyone and, and setting my own pace. Okay. And that would be what keeps me occupied. Mm. Second 12 hours, probably don't have get a choice about the pace, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. you know, the support group <laughs> I have to might say, well, you're dropping off the pace there. And it's like, it doesn't matter. This is a pace. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, at a mountain ultra then, uh, it, uh, very much more so on feel because, you know, you have to, the good thing about the flat ones is you, you, you can actually use the watch and dial it out and learn as you go. Mm. And I use all those flat ones as pacing learning. And that first 24 hour race I was talking about in Tooting Beck was the, probably the biggest learning experience I ever had. Uh, and it was in fact so much went wrong, which allowed me to learn so much as it mm. happens. The more things go wrong, the more you do get to learn. Because mm. uh, I try not to make the same mistake twice. Uh, and over the years, it, I do tend to, uh, make different mistakes rather than the same ones over and over which <laughs> thank god uh find new weaknesses i suppose so for a mountain ultra pacing is much more about feel and uh you know because you, you can't be bombing up hills at the same pace you're going downhill so you have to go with the flow but it's dialing into that internal feeling of re rpe is the technical term rate of perceived uh, exertion and a lot of research recently that it's as valid a measure as any other measure mm. uh, in, in terms of um, your training uh, uh, measures. So, um, if for, and I'm obviously being learning early on that I was good at pacing, I have a pretty good feel for it. And I think that's one of my key uh, strengths I bring to ultra running and what allows me to, mm. to get competitive is to know how to pace and if i was to say oh, one of the most useful things you can do as a runner is is learn that pacing and learn how to feel it for yourself yeah. not rely on the watches not rely on the, mm. the notes mm. but just learn how to feel it out naturally yourself because yeah. if you can feel it out you can adjust that in a race uh, you can know how to push and know when not to push and that's key for being competitive yeah. and of course you also have to know 
it's kind of hard to define, but obviously there's a big difference between pacing for, you know, a 50k race versus something like the spine, which is going to go on for four yeah. or five days. Yeah. So, you, you know, it's very different pacing field, but, you know, you still feel that you're working hard, but in a completely different way. Yeah. And have, so, you, have you found yeah. that's come with experience? The more you've done, the better you've become at doing that. Absolutely. And it's just a training as well. You know, mm. if, you, if you're, if you throw away the watch when you're training, because when I train, I, I either know the distance or the time, but I never try and know both because I, I actually try and dial in mm. and get it naturally. You know, so yeah. for me, a hard work is a hard, hard workout is a workout that feels hard. Mm. An easy workout is a workout that feels easy. I don't actually care what the, the timings are. Um, so I have training routes that I don't know the distance of, and yeah. I don't want to know the distance of. You know? <laughs> okay, that's really helpful. Okay, the next question we've got is from Ian Evans, and he wants to know, is the spine an, an annual fixture for you? Will you carry on doing it? And I think, Ian, it's one of the races that you're well known for. You've won the spine, and this year you were right up there. It was a very competitive race. Um, so just tell us a little bit about what attracts you to the spine and whether you'll you'll keep doing it. Yeah, I keep saying never again, and somehow I keep <laughs> ending up there. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's because I realized that if I wasn't there, I'd probably spend a week watching dots, wondering how I'd be doing. And it's probably mentally a lot easier guys, to be out there suffering than to be sitting in front of a computer screen, not suffering. So, uh, yeah, what attracts me is it's the, it is, it has to be the hardest. I mean, that's what makes the spine so interesting. The fact that you're going up uh, the middle of England, up into Scotland in January. So that it's all, everything is wrong. You're guaranteed bad weather. You're guaranteed far more darkness than light. It's just, it's that, it's going to test you. And it's the, the testy bit that makes it interesting and makes it into, into an interesting race mm. because so much of that feeds into a more interesting race. Conditions are straightforward. The racing is simpler. And I do like the purity of, um, you know, straightforward races like a 24 hour race, which is dead flat in loops. Um, you know, hopefully with, with relatively normal weather most of the time, where something like spine is always completely the opposite to that, and that is so many variables thrown in because you're adding in navigation, mm. you're adding in logistics, you're adding in uh, sleep, et cetera, et cetera, and oh, so much. And that's what makes it interesting for me, you know, uh, just a great challenging race. So the answer is uh, I, I would often say no, but the reality is I'll probably end up doing it for as long as I can because I just love it. And it's a great atmosphere in the spine as well. You know, um, the spine family really is a thing. It's 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 you're meeting these great people. Uh, it's great to, to meet them all again every year. And new people come in. Yeah. And of course, it's a characteristic of ultra running that everyone tends to be great people anyway. So yeah. but, and another nice thing about the spine now is it, it's quite international now. Mm. Uh, you know, we had a, a look at the top ten. We had all sorts of countries there, and that's great as yeah. well. You know, yeah. so I, I put one or two photos. I put one or two photos on as you were chatting there from the spine, and one of them was you and John Kelly at the end. Um, ah, yeah. And then there's another question which sort of links with that from Aaron Aaron Gawley, and he says, "Who would you say has been your fierce, fiercest competitor in the spine races you've done?" Oh, that's a good question. Um, in terms of head to head, for, <laughs> you know, it, it it can be different, but I suppose uh, it certainly was Pavo for for many a year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that was a hell of a battle because yeah. uh, he was when I started, he was the man to take down, and uh, <laughs> yeah, which I ended up doing in the end. But uh, we've had some great battles over the years. Um, Eugenie as well, in a, in a slightly different way. It's a different battery, Eugenie. The thing about himself and Pavel is that we're very well matched. And, uh, you know, I, I'd, I would have a slight speed edge in him, but he, he's pretty tough and uh, he's relentless as well. We have a very similar background as well and that we have the same strengths because he's an adventure racer as well. Mm. Uh, he's a navigator in his adventure racing team, so am I. So, you know, we... <laughs> 
That that makes it very interesting. We should probe for a weakness. You find we both find neither of us has that weakness, <laughs> so it just ends up being a much more straightforward race. Whereas Eugenie would be quite different in that way, uh, and even John Kelly, you know, his speed would stand out, whereas you know his lack of experience on the race would have been uh, his weakness there. So it's it varies, you know. Whereas uh, in terms of who, you know who gave you the best race, I mean, it was undoubtedly. Um, you know, Jasmine, but then I'm not, I'm not giving her what you're right. So <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get me. Yeah. <laughs> she just blitzed everyone. <laughs> oh, it's impressive, wasn't it? Yeah. Good. Well, we've got one or two more questions in, but I'd like just to, sh to pause now and just show a little clip. And it's, well, it's five minutes and it's a, it's your film from when you did the, your run across Ireland. So do you want to just, just tell, introduce it for us about um, what it's about? Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, running across Ireland was, was something I had in my head to do for literally about 10 years or so. And every, I just keep putting it off for a next year thing mm. to do until about two or three years ago. And I finally realized, OK, here's a window. Let's go for it. Um, and yeah, it's just one of those things I always wanted to do. The, the record when I started looking, it was four and a half days. And I reckon it could be done on under four. And uh but it was actually three three days fifteen by the time I got to do it, um, and even still, I reckon I could still give it a go. But it was just one of those things I really wanted to do, run the length of the country, and, and for me, it felt it felt doing it like it was a, a culmination of all those years and years and years of training. Mm. And uh, it ended up if I had to pick out, you know, what was the favorite thing I ever did, that's probably it. Or okay. what I what would I put at the top of the yeah. list? It would be run. Across the length of Ireland. Okay, well, let's watch it. It lasts five minutes, and then we'll come back and we'll pick up with the qu any more questions. And if people are watching, have you got any more questions? Just put them on, and we'll feed them in afterwards. So you can sit back, and we'll watch this for five minutes, and then we'll catch up in a in a moment. Running the length of Ireland from Nathan to Mallon has been my mind for years and years and years. It was always something that sounded really interesting to me. It's not a race to just pay money to enter. It's a bigger undertaking than just entering a race. Richard and Taryn were my support team. Yeah, they're my adventure racing teammates. Four o'clock, eight hours in. Um, as you can see behind us, Ian is still flying along. He stopped and stood once. Back when I first thought about running Mallon to Missing the Record, stood at over four days. But then Mimi came along. Not only has she gone below four days, she's gone well below four days. There's now no margins of error here. I'm going to have to get everything right to beat that. Here's Ian, 233 kilometres in. And in. Great news, 300 kilometers, he's true at 9 o'clock this evening. Woo! Um, Woo! How are you feeling man, 300k true, happy? Oh, happy. Normally in a, a multi-day race, particularly a multi-day race on roads, they are extremely painful events. Morning, it's 5.53am, uh, we're in Leitrim. How are you feeling Ian? Oh, okay. Do you know, I, I really do hate uh, sleep deprivation is my most disliked thing about ultra running. So a lot of it from day two on can be about managing pain, putting it into the back of your head, forgetting it's there. My plan was to eat as little as possible knowing that I could pretty much eat nothing and probably get away with it. You know, people ask, how do you, how do you run around the loop for days to keep yourself motivated? You know, I love competing. And uh, I've always said I prefer to beat people by out racing them than out running them.
Now I'm losing speed because you know I'm 48 doing this into Manon, so my speed isn't what it was, but my endurance has never been better because endurance is mostly built on experience. Keep going. Oh, are you getting on in? Coming into Enniskillen. If I could actually feel myself getting faint. The heat was rising. We got towards the town itself, the traffic was getting very heavy, it was slightly less enjoyable. It just all became too much, so I had to take a lie down on that. I could feel my mind starting to float away a bit. But I can only remember one or two things I was actually thinking about, but I was thinking intensively throughout it. Okay. Might feel the best, but everything is actually fine. And I sort of cornered myself and said, you've no more excuses. There's the window, take it. Ninety K left. Um, he's just gonna go for it. Well done. Hey! Give it go! Fifty to go! Alright, buddy, give it going! But I was running up towards the finish in my head and sort of thinking to myself, we had a, a great sunrise then back up into the hills and over the peninsula and then the hills at Mallon Head itself and seeing them from a distance and then climbing up over them and again, that was all. Unbelievably perfect. Unbelievable. Well done, they keep going. You need to go right to the point. Definitely the best run I've, I've ever done. <laughs> I've always ignored any, anybody who tells me reasons to stop. I, I want to go on forever. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that. That was uh, Ian running across Ireland and that was uh, that must have been an, an amazing event. So as you think back on that, is that, as you say, that's one of the, maybe one of the proudest things you've done? Yeah, and I count it as my, my best running result because I, I shattered the records. No one else has tried to break it since. <laughs> um, and it felt like it was the accumulation of a lifetime of training that everything just slotted into place for that one, you know, in terms of all it. Because I felt at the end of it, having run for three days, you know, three hours, um, I finished on a high. I was actually running way faster than I thought I would be running at the time in sunshine and in Donegal, which is practically uh, mm. physically impossible, but I <laughs> got a lucky break. And it just felt so brilliant. Uh, you know, very little went wrong. Um, it just was just one of those perfect experiences. Yeah. You don't get them very often, or anything. <laughs> Actually, well, we've got some more questions in and some really good ones here, so we'll, let's deal with these. Um, Scott Williamson says, Hi, Ian. Any future ambitions to run, to run any of our Scottish ultra races? Um, I'm based here in Paisley near Glasgow, and I'm very involved in the West Highland Way race. So would that be a race or any of the Scottish races that you'd be interested in? Yeah, I mean, the problem is I'm interested in all of them. So <laughs> you can only do so many. West Island Way is obviously a classic, yeah. you know, and, and the classics definitely are things I'd love to get to. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Cape Rat would be great if it was a straight race rather than the stage race. Uh, <laughs> right, okay. I'd love to do a straight, non-stop version of something like that. Would be great. Yeah. Um, is that your preference then? And of course, I do get into Scotland every year. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm not a. I'm not a massive fan of stage races. Okay. Um, it suits me more, and I'm yeah. more competitive doing the non-stop ones. Right. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, and I suppose stage racing—it's it's slightly more tame, for want of a better word, than the non-stop versions. There's less uh, factors to deal with, mm. uh, so just slightly less interesting for me. Mm. But still, the the Cape Rat looks awesome. Mm. You know, I watched the first one. 
as it was going on. I was following out maps and just couldn't, you know, I'm a good map, good, uh, I enjoy watching maps. I can sit down in front of a map for days and just look at it. Mm -hmm. So watching the Cape Rat, I thought, man, this looks absolutely an amazing route. If it's this good on the maps, it must yeah. be awesome in reality. So yeah, there's lots out there. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that, you know, lots of long-term ambitions. Uh, if if I could figure out how to do it, you know, I'd like to do, uh, I'd like to end up at John O'Groats to, to mm -hmm. head to Land's End or vice versa sometime, but that's another one. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, ah, so, yeah. yeah. No, no immediate plans though, obviously, yeah. since there's no races at the moment to yeah. start. <laughs> well, I must say, you'd be, uh, anytime you want to do the West Hallam Way race, you'd be very, very welcome and we'd, uh, we'd love to have you. Oh, I'll get there. I'll yeah. get there. Good. Good. <laughs> now, this next question is a good one. This is Oliver Noakes, who did, he was in, he ran the Dragon's Back last, last year. And he said, at what point of distance or time do you think the mental and other aspects, such as fuel, planning, sleep, ability to suffer, becomes more important than purely physical fitness? It's a very good question. Um, I, I'm tending to go with Yanis Kouros on this one. And, and Yanis uh, kind of, he famously went to the IAU, the International Governing Body for Ultra Running, and asked them to basically drop all races less than 24 hours because he didn't consider them to be ultra running. <laughs> and I know where he's coming from, oddly enough. I can see what he's saying. And that to me, you know, if you're a marathon, if you're a good marathon runner, should be able to take that all the way up to 100 k mm. um i'm based on the same training mm. and the same kind of physical aspect but anyone who's who's made that journey to a 24 hour race will realize that you stepped over some kind of mm. boundary there it's hard to define but something changes quite significantly mm. and it's a different kind of race and it's no longer about the pure speed uh that a lot more comes into it. So for me, it's somewhere between 100K and 24 hour racing, which, you know, in my case would be about 230, 240K. But again, it could be a time thing as well. And with 100K for me, it would be about eight hours and 24 hours self defines there. So somewhere in between those two is for me where it turns in from not just such a pure speed over distance, but adds in all those other factors yeah. like. No. And I, I make the definition in my own head of speed ultras versus endurance ultras. So 100K okay. is a speed ultra, yeah. and 24 hours is an endurance ultra. So, and I know I'll happily divide ultras into those mm. categories yeah. and ultra runners into those categories in terms of what they're good at. Yeah. But a very good question. Yeah. And he also says, as an aside, what time do you think you could do a road marathon in at the moment? That's a very good question as well. I often often wonder that myself. I've never done a road marathon in less than in oh, sorry in more than three hours, but the last one I did on road was nineteen ninety two. So that's mm. quite a long time ago. Yeah. So now I'm fifty one. Uh, I probably don't have that speed anymore, so that would be more questionable. But the honest answer is, I would hope under three hours, but I have no actual idea. Okay. And I don't care either, no. to be honest. <laughs> okay, a great question from uh, Phil Owen. Hello, Ian. I remember you coming into Bellingham checkpoint the year you won the spine. You only stayed for 22 minutes, and apart from a cup of hot chocolates, were not interested in eating at all, causing some consternation at the time. So what is your nutrition policy in general and long races like the spine in particular? Uh, in general, my nutrition policy is not to eat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I do all my training runs without eating and leaving the largest gap possible between the run and the previous time I've eaten. Um, so uh, I regularly at weekends would do uh, a five or six hour, maybe a seven hour run. And at the end of it, I'm not even hungry. And that would be straight out, uh, you know, get up, get dressed, go out running. So I wouldn't have eaten uh, in the morning. The last time I'd eaten would have been the night before. And, you know, and uh, like last, you know, so I'd get to six o'clock or seven o'clock in the evening. And sometimes I could actually stretch that out if I'm making my own dinner and not, end up not eating till nine or 10 at night. So it could be nearly a 22 hour gap at a seven hour run in there as just normal training. Uh, I'm perfectly comfortable doing that. So uh, I'm not trying to do anything particularly special diet-wise, but I, I have turned myself 
into a very efficient fat burner as a result. Mm. So I know that I have enough fat that I can do multi-day runs without needing to eat. Now, it might be the most competitive thing, not eating for other reasons, but I know I don't need to, which is a huge psychological advantage. And I can use that in, in a racing situation, and I have done many times. Uh, the last off-road marathon I, did, I ran, which was a uh, Causeway Coast Marathon up in Northern Ireland, I can remember there was about a four-way battle for the lead in the early stages, and we were coming into an aid station. And I accelerated through the aid station, knowing that the others had probably been anticipating stopping to get something to eat. So my idea was either I break the elastic band uh, by having them stop and I run sprint out of there at the maximum speed I was willing to do and open a gap, or they follow me and they'll be psychologically undermined by the fact that they can't, couldn't eat there when they wanted to, and I'll be perfectly happy about it. So there's all sorts of things going on in terms of not needing to eat there. Plus, if you don't need to eat, you're not going to give yourself stomach issues. You're not going to have to stop as often to uh, dispose of waste, etc. Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> You know, so I, I can, I can. It's not that I'm trying to go without eating. I actually just don't need to eat that often yeah. uh, uh, in races, yeah. and that's because I, I train not to eat that often. Yeah. I do lose a lot of fat during races. Uh, you know, at the end of the spine, I'm often five kilos lighter than mm. uh, when I start there or thereabouts. Yeah. But again, and it's not an uncomfortable situation. I do eat when I feel like it. Yeah. It's just that I don't feel like it that yeah. often. And yeah. um, usually I end up transport. I, I noticed from my adventure racing days that I ended, usually ended up transporting food around the course uh, you know? yeah. <laughs> and giving it to my teammates yeah. more than anything. Uh, while they'd be freaking out about running out of food and say, oh, here, I've tons, I've tons, take this, take this. Um, and it was one of those things I discovered like I was doing naturally anyway mm. and then i learned the science from a friend of mine barry murray who's a sports scientist and he explained to me that's about fat burning and how it works and etc etc and then i learned more by looking at you know a lot of lots of stuff from tim noakes and so on and all the science behind it and knowing the science i can now fine tune it a bit better uh, yeah. so that i actually rather than doing it accidentally and naturally i'm actually learning how to do it and using it strategically um and of course, for ultra running, mainly there's no downside. In fact, it's far more preferable to trying to burn glycogen because if you're burning sugar, glycogen, whatever, you have to carry around an awful lot of it with you, which, if nothing else, is a logistical problem. Uh, and there's something to go wrong, and it's quite often a weight issue as well. Uh, so there's all, all sorts of downsides. So, yeah, if I'm not hungry, I'm not eating. Yeah. Simple as that, yeah. <laughs> you know. Okay, next question we've got from James Bliger. He said, would you like to race with Jim Wormsley? I, I think Jim Wormsley is someone who's come <laughs> onto the scene, isn't he, with a, a, often a, a different way of running. He just hammers it from the start, doesn't he? Yeah, well, there, there's a there's a speed ultra runner, mm. going back to our previous definition. Yeah. Now, having, I've seen Jim live. I watched him finish his first year at the UTMB. And I have to say, he's got a mo he's probably got the most beautiful running style of any ultra runner I've ever seen. Mm. Uh, I'd heard about it. I was saying, how good could this be? And then I saw him. I said, oh yeah, yeah. that's that's just an amazing running style. He's like nobody else here, yeah. <laughs> you know. He's just like otherworldly in the way he he runs. But at the same time, um, we're not quite competing the same way. Obviously, I could not get near him any kind of speed ultra. He's just way too fast. Um, and in Jim's case, that takes him up to about a hundred miles. Be interesting after that. I'd be uh, I'd be curious to see how it go in a twenty four hour. He should still be pretty fast, but knowing him, he'd overpace it yeah. and yeah. blow up. Yeah. I reckon I'd, if he did his first 24 hour and I was racing against him, I reckon I'd beat him. But he might win the second one then. <laughs> <laughs> and if it was a race like the Northern Traverse or the Spine, you'd fancy your chances, would you? Be, I'd fancy my chances, yeah. yeah. Just, my, just the experience. He'd, he'd be leading me for a long time, but I would I'd be wrecking in a, on a blow up there, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, if I was perfectly honest about him. Yeah. He tends to take a little bit. He tends to, he's a very aggressive racer, which I admire a lot. Mm -hmm. But of course, that can work against you. Yeah. Uh, as it did in the first two Western states, where his sheer 
you know, because he wasn't running to win, he was running to smash the record, and that meant he did win out of it. Yeah. But of course, once he put it all together, he did smash yeah. the record. So, you know, it's, it's an admirable trait, but it's a weakness at, yeah. t- at times for him. I must admit, when I've seen clips of him at about 50, 60, 70 miles in the Western States, and you see him running into an aid station. It looks as though he's doing a 10K race, doesn't he? You know, his, his, yeah, his, his running style is incredible. <laughs> yeah. Oh. It really is. It, it's a thing of beauty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you are as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, that, 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 that would be fun to watch you uh, racing against him, particularly on a, a longer one. Now, another race I'd like to talk a little to. bit about, Ian, is your, uh, the, um, the UTMB Oman race that you did last year. And uh, I'm just going to put the, um, the course map up on the screen here. Obviously, you won't be able to see this, but it's um, just tell us a little bit about this this race because I know you really enjoyed it last year, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, and I do like deserts. But, you know, uh, some of my favorite races I've ever done. My favorite adventure race I ever did was in uh, uh, the desert in Utah, and this is definitely up there with my favorite uh, mountain running races for sure. Uh, I just love Devon's environments, and Oman's a beautiful country, uh, great people there as well, very friendly, very welcoming, and uh, this isn't actually a sandy desert, it's it's a mountain range, and it's the highest mountain range in Arabia, so the race uh, last year, the 170k version, uh, went to the highest mountain in Arabia, which is, uh, well, I've forgotten the height, but I'm, I think it must be 3,000 meters or so. Um, so you get a lot of interesting ups and downs, to say the least. And there was two highly technical climbs in the race, one where you had to put on uh, via Ferrata gear and climb up via Ferrata, and another section where you, it was unsupervised, but you were still climbing up, uh, you know, uh, steel steps which have been put in rocks to, to get over a few, a few particularly steep sections so well, the thing I loved about it as well it, it's possibly the most sustained technical running I've ever raced in that uh, the first year I did it which was two years ago it was, a, it was the longest one was 135k and uh, that 135k was pretty much non-stop technical the whole way where you know, a lot of races afterwards to talk to them they were battered by the course and they did they didn't enjoy the technicality whereas a lot of more experienced runners thought wow that was just amazing it was so brilliantly technical i loved every minute of it which is my category mm-hmm. and uh, so for the 170 the bits that were added on were even more technical than the 135 so it just took it you know it raised it up a level which made it even better from my point of view and quite wild as well in in ways so uh yeah, I just loved it. Loved the whole experience. So I, I like, you know, being up in the mountains in the desert, amazing views. Um, but the two years, we had different start times. So I got to see some stuff in daylight this year, which I didn't see last year. And, you know, scenery, big, big around sunrises and sunsets out there is, is awesome. Yeah. Absolutely awesome. Plus, uh, being um, being highly technical races, they run a bit slower, so they tend to fall to my advantage of being an, an endurance ultra runner as opposed to a speed ultra runner. Mm. And particularly this year, which was the 170k course, and the first time they'd run that course, so I knew it was going to take more than 24 hours uh, to, to, to complete it. Whereas I think a lot of people didn't realise it would run that long, mm. or certainly weren't trained as well to run that long, which resulted in me winning the thing because. I knew how to race for 36 hours, which is what took uh, took me to finish. Yeah. Whereas uh, the guy who, uh, the local guy, the Amani guy, who obviously was far more experienced in running in the desert and indeed had, had trained out there, uh, uh, he had everything except the ability to know how to to pace over that kind of time and distance so <laughs> sometimes these things work for you but man it was a great race yeah. and it was again one of my highlights of my life was realizing that my god i'm going to win this thing i got to win a utmb yeah. race yeah. you know which is not something i anticipated i'd ever managed to do yeah. but yeah another one where the pieces, pieces fell into place where the course was sufficiently long and technical that i just started playing to my advantages plus i had that other advantage of not needing too much food and not needing too much liquid compared to other people so i'm able comfortably able to deal with running low on either of those which 
no, it's not a factor for me, so that all works quite well as well. Yeah, well, well done. It does sound amazing. Um, I'm conscious of time. We're coming up to 10 to 8, and I'd like to finish before 8 so we can get outside and um, applaud the NHS and the key workers. But we've got another good question from Sinead Foley. I think I've said that right. S-I-N-E-A-D. Sinead. Sinead. Sorry, Sinead. Sinead. Yeah, Sinead Foley. The races you train for are so hard, you must put yourself through hard training sessions in the mountains. Have you had any crazy accidents with nobody knowing where you are in training? Uh, nothing crazy. Um, I, uh, I did trip once and sort of brushed myself down and realized there was something stuck to my finger. And when I looked down, I realized it was another one of my finger, which I just broken. <laughs> so I just snapped it back into place and carried on, basically. <laughs> that was about the worst of it. No surgeons in the middle of the mountains, so I just placed it myself. Uh, but no, nothing, nothing mad in uh, in running training. I've never had anything seriously weird happen. Yeah, there's a few odd incidents out in the hills, uh, running past a uh, a uh, nude sunbather in the middle of nowhere was possibly the oddest. <laughs> or one night again in the middle of nowhere, or uh, in a forest, a guy who appeared to be making a music video for himself, just playing his guitar and singing in front of a camera in the middle of nowhere <laughs> as I ran past. So but, uh, apart from that, nothing, nothing particularly bad. I, any, any madness has tended to be more mountain biking related back in earlier years okay. where there's been all sorts of calamities went on. Okay. That's where I learned what broken bones feel like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got five quick, 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 Quick questions to finish with, um, just to, to finish off, and just want to thank you again for share, uh, sharing with us tonight. Um, but the first one is, the best piece of advice you've been given? Oh, God. Um, phew, there, there was that whole body of advice about uh, fat burning, which I picked up from mm. Barry Murray, which was yeah. really useful in terms of just finishing me out as a runner. Uh, there's one very small bit of one I read, which is more to do with um, flat ultra running, the 24 hours and beyond, particularly the six days, which was if you're going to change shoes, change brands as well, because uh, the, the shoe brands are built on a different last, depending on the brand. So all those hot spots which you pick up will change. Uh, this is just a small one, but yeah. it actually worked, yeah. funny, you know. Yeah. Um, but no, a lot of stuff I've actually just learned myself, yeah. and mm. uh, possibly the, the 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 key bit of advice I would give out is question everything, right? Okay. Because yeah. uh, including what I say, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. but ask the questions because most running advice is frankly is, is wrong, yeah. and that's <laughs> probably the biggest turn thing I learned over the years. Right. Okay. <laughs> Secondly, uh, what is your favourite piece of kit? Uh, I would say uh, probably my Outdry Extreme jacket, Columbia Outdry Extreme jacket. It's actually such a good piece of waterproof kit, and it's a life and death piece of kit on uh, in lights the spine. So even going through Storm Brendan this year, where we were getting hit big time, both you know John Kelly and myself were, were looking at each other and saying that was bad, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, and you know I was all huddled up in. I was uh, out dry extreme and just not feeling it. You know, the wetness doesn't get through. And it's, it's, yeah, I am sponsored by Columbia, but even so, it is, uh, it's a piece of, I don't wear the kit if I don't like it. Yeah. And this kit I just absolutely love. Yeah. It's brilliant. Good. Thank you very much. And um, what is your favorite go to food in a long old trip? But maybe for you, it's, there isn't one. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is. Uh, if if I could get at it, mm. ice cream. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. And then um, this is a bit hard, this one, but if you could only do one more ultra, which one would it be? And uh, I think it's interesting okay. that you, you love the 24-hour races around a track and you also love the six-day or multi-day events. But if you had to choose, what would it be? Barkley. Right. Okay. <laughs> Bark, it has to be. Yeah. <laughs> Hardest yeah. race in the world. Yeah. And I've got a lot left out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I must admit, I, like many people, I was following your progress and I've listened to one or two interviews that you've done since. And it was obviously a, a big learning curve uh, in, in the, one, the one that you did. Do you plan to run this year? Uh, not 
this year, no, no. but uh, I would like to get back to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll can't look. say much about no, that. No, no, of course. I know. We'll look. We'll look. For... It is, yeah, yeah. It is, it's better than it sounds. That's all I'm really saying. And it's even better. Yeah. Good. And then the last question: uh, Do you have a mantra to keep you going when things get tough? Sort of men mental strategy. Uh, I don't have a mantra, but I do think they're a good idea. But I, I did know, I, I had a, an old pal of mine who died a few years ago from cancer, who I knew from mountain biking, Richie Byrne, and he was a very colorful character, just all character and personality. And you'd follow him anywhere just to see what would happen. But he used to say, uh, I'd clean it up and say, harden the feck up. So I'd find myself uh, climbing hills on my bike and I'd hear Richie's voice in my head just going, harden the feck up. If I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of, the nearest I have to a mantra is, is Richie talking to me in my head saying, yeah. you know, what do you want to do? Just harden up and do it. Go on. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much for tonight. It's been great. And just to finish with, uh, what are your plans for the rest of the year? Obviously, we don't know with races at the moment. Um, but if you've got anything planned that you hope you still be able to run this year? The next one I think is feasible would be the UTMB. But I'd say that's only 50-50. Mm. I have I've higher hopes for Oman being on again because it's not till December. Yeah. Uh, but it's obviously it all depends on what races are on. I actually have an entry to uh, Big's Backyard Ultra as well, of yeah. course. Uh, yeah. That's another possible. But we'll see what happens. Yeah. 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 God only knows. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we will follow that progress and we hope that we can get back in the hills. Um, so thank you very much and we wish you all the best and uh, keep your training going and we look forward to seeing what other races that you take part in in the coming years. But thanks so much, oh, Ian. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. thanks for everyone for all the questions as well. It's been great. Yeah, there's been good questions there and there's been quite a few people watching and then others, I'll put it on my YouTube channel so people can watch it at, uh, in their own leisure as well. So thank you very much. Great. Night. Night. <laughs>